All right. Welcome back. Semester is winding down. Um, you have a homework due tomorrow. There, this is the last kind of main section of the course that we're going through. And um, I think it's simultaneously like important conceptually. And I also know that you're seniors and graduating and burnt out. And so it's kind of also like technically, there's a lot of technical details that I'm going to be presenting, but I kind of want you to know that like really the, at the end of this portion of the class, what I'd like you to feel a little bit comfortable with is seeing the connection between the stuff you learn in class and how you might encounter a final approach somewhere down the line. So this is not, it's really hard because I have to kind of show you all the details, otherwise it doesn't really make any sense. It just kind of, again, gives me a black box, excuse me, a black box of like a computer code that solves the problem. But I kind of appreciate that that right now this is not the there's not the bandwidth to absorb all of those details. Um, so I'm trying to strike a balance there, but I guess that what I want you to take away is that there's a procedure trying to structure into little bits of, kind of members that we can figure out how they each member responds to being pushed on or poked on the twisted event. And if we take all those little members and stick them back into structure, we can solve for how the entire structure is going to behave. And so I, <clears throat> I wish I could kind of make the last bit of this more, um, more digestible or more easy, I guess. But I, I, I do want to emphasize that my goal is for you to at least have some idea of what's happening behind the curtain. And so if you're lost on some of the technical details, like it's not to say that that doesn't matter. It's to say you, we can, you can still kind of not lose the forest for the trees. And that, and that the forest is, okay, well, how is your computer solving? what's happening to these structures. And what it's doing is it's splitting it up into tiny elements, figuring out what's happening in each element, assembling that into some big equation that it can solve, and solving that for the for this entire structure. And, and this is a general algorithm that works for that. And I I I hope it can give you some confidence and an understanding of what's going on underneath the hood. So Bear with me, um, but my goal is for you to kind of leave this last section of the course feeling like you have some idea of the connection between the equations of solid mechanics and what's happening when, you know, advocates or ANSYS or console or whatever is solving some particular uh, structural deformation problem that you're working on. So with that said, it's, it's technical, but I, I want you to focus on the bigger picture if you can. And I'm going to try to make it so that way I'm trying to emphasize what the bigger picture is, uh, so that none of that gets kind of lost uh, in this, this sea of details here. We're trying to solve a pretty simple looking equation. And that simple looking equation is just that the force is like the spring equation. We're trying to solve this. F equals K U. That's it. You know, that's 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 what we're after right here. At least for simple linear structures, just experiencing forces that we're used to in a solid mechanics setting. This is all we're really trying to do. And I'll remind you that you know some of this stuff. What I mean is this thing here is a vector and it contains your applied forces. Which are known.
and it contains your reaction forces. Which are unknown. Also a vector is your displacement. This contains your constraints. Or boundary conditions. These are generally known. And it contains your displacements. Of everything else. This is generally unknown. So each of these vectors will typically have some el elements or components that you know, and some elements or components that you don't know. And this is all we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to solve this. And so clearly the missing link here is K. So what's K? And that's where all of our, our work is focused on. And to figure out K, what we do is find K for each member of the structure. Local coordinates. And then we convert K. Global coordinates And then we add the global coordinate stiffness matrix. To the master stiffness matrix. And now we're in a position to solve. So we don't know K. We start by finding what K is for a simple number in your structure. That's what the KE means. And we do that by finding that KE in its local coordinate system. And that means that the coordinates run along the backbone of that number, like the X axis. We do a little linear algebra. Convert that elemental stiffness matrix to a global one. And then we write a little algorithm that's going to stick that elemental stiffness matrix into the master stiffness matrix. This part is like the tricky part computationally. I don't know. We usually we do it in class. We kind of spend time kicking around trying to figure out what the best way to write that algorithm is. So what you end up with is like a big, huge stiffness matrix, like um, with just tons and tons of spots. And what you're doing is taking a tiny 
elemental k, and you're saying it's got it's got this. And you're trying to figure out, oh, okay, this spot here goes there, this one goes over here, this one goes up here. And you're kind of add, you're kind of like taking the components of each local to the matrix and adding it to this big matrix. This might be super confusing and terrifying, looking, but it's, it's essentially a way of saying, how do the members, how does each individual element of your structure contribute to the stiffness of the structure? And it's each individual member is going to respond to forces in certain directions differently than others. And so this kind of last step here is how we're assembling directly this master stiffness matrix. And we'll get to that. But this is kind of the procedure. We generally know some of the applied forces. We know some of the, the, straight, the displacements. We don't know any of the reaction forces. We don't know the displacements of the three nodes. And we're left with trying to figure out K. Our procedure is figure out K in the local coordinates. We did that last class. So let me remind you, what did we find last class? KE in local coordinates we found to be for a bar or a spring, something really, really simple. It was just EA, no, sorry, E A over L times. One, zero, negative one, zero. So we did that last class. Where we stopped was trying to get figure out what KE is in global court. And that's where we're going to pick up today. And then after we figure out that, we can talk about how to assemble that into the master matrix. Figuring out how to transform the local stiffness matrix into the global into the global coordinate system requires us to do a little bit of linear algebra. We started this last time. We have to transform our objects, right? We have to, we have an equation here. The way we found this, this thing here. Is if you recall, we were looking at the the, the stiffness equation for an individual element in its local coordinates. And so the idea is if I want to find out what this thing is in global coordinates, I want to get rid of that bar, I want the coordinate system of, of my stiffness matrix to be relative to the coordinate system of the structure. Then I need to, I can transform my force vectors and transform my displacement vectors into global coordinates. And this just requires us to do some linear algebra. Before I get started on linear algebra, are there questions about about this, about what we're doing and why, conceptual or technical. Our goal is the following. I can kind of sketch out the, the way we're going to do this. It, the way we're going to do this is we want this. We have this. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to get an equation that says, well, I would like to be able to write that F equals something times F bar. So that something is going to be like a rotation matrix of sorts. How do I rotate F bar to get it to be F? We're going to do that again, but we're going to do it for our displacement matrix. One thing that's really confusing, and that's because we haven't spent a lot of time, and we won't, be, we won't spend a lot of time talking about this, is that forces and displacements are actually different types of vectors, and so they transform differently. What that means in this practical sense is, is what you're going to see here is that our, our force in the global coordinate system is equal to something times our force in the local coordinate system. But our displacement uh, vector is going to be equal to something times my new coordinates. It looks backwards. Basically, you look at that, and the first thing you see is on one side the bar is on the left, on one side the bar is on the right. That's because force and displacements are different types of vectors. Different types of vectors transform differently, which means if you want to switch the coordinate system of a force vector, you do it in a different way than you transform the coordinate system of a displacement vector. For 90% of the people in this class, that's all you need to know. We're going on to do more work in, either in advanced finite elements, elasticity, continuum mechanics, and you can get into the details of why these are different types of vectors and what that physically means. But basically what it means is they, they transform differently. You have to, if you want to change them, uh, when you change coordinate systems, you have to do so differently. And so that's why on one side you have a bar on the U, and then on the other side it's, it's, it's flipped for your force vector. But the idea is now that we could take this and insert it into here. And I'll have now replaced U bar with a U. And I can take this with a little bit of extra work, replace this into here. And have something that's kind of like F equals some stuff times U. And that some stuff is the, oops, that whatever is left is going to be what this matrix looks like in, in global coordinates. So that's this, the rough outline. So we first need these two. I'm going to switch the order actually because we did this. Last class, a little bit. Okay. We did this last class, so I'm not going to go through it super uh, slowly, but what we did last class was to say transform. And the way this works is just linear algebra. If you were to, for instance, if you were to just take a vector uh, u that is um, ux and y, then to transform this vector, what you would do is you would take this to make u bar is equal to u dot u. And that gives us two of the equations we found last class. What, what equations are those? If you look back in your notes, you would find that that gives you u of x i equals u x i cos theta plus u y i sine theta. These should be in your notes from last class. And if you're wondering where that blue equation comes from, it just comes from taking the Rotation matrix, which is cosine, sine, negative sine, cosine, and dotting it into your vector. Just rotating that vector. If you look through your notes, you can see the other three of these things. And the end result was that u xi bar. The 
elemental displacements and local coordinates <clears throat> are equal to this big transformation matrix. And this big transformation matrix looks sort of like two rotation matrices kind of stuck together. So it's like um, cosine theta, sine theta, nothing. Neg uh, negative sine theta, cosine theta, nothing. And then repeat. And just as a reminder, I'm being lazy. This and then that multiplied into psi, yi, xj, yj, And the important takeaway here is this thing is just, it's just linear algebra. It's just sine and cosines, transforming displacements from one to the next. And we're going to call this the elemental transformation matrix. We're going to give it the letters T. This is going to look pretty much the same. It's just flipped. So to give you an example of what I mean by that, we can do the same thing. We can say I'm going to have a, a vector f. We'll call it f bar. A equal to f bar x f bar y. And so if I want to find f, I would take bar dot in Q. You'll notice you kind of compare this equation to this equation. Everything's kind of flipped. On the left hand side, the bar term is on the left and the Q is on the left. On the right hand side, the bar term is on the right and the Q is on the right. And this, again, this is super confusing when you're seeing it for the first time, but it just has to do with the fact that there's two types of ways a vector can transform and forces and displacements transform in different ways. The way things transform is like literally the definition of a tensor, the most annoying definitional science, which is just that a trans uh, a tensor is an object that transforms like a tensor. Self-referential, super annoying. But then like there's a time in your life where you think about it for long enough, you're like, oh, that makes sense. Um, but basically like the whole definition is based on all that, that is like the most important thing about tensors is the way they change coordinates. And so on, that's kind of what it's getting at. And so these things change coordinates in different ways, and you're kind of seeing that in the equations I highlighted in yellow. For like the for like the practical purposes of moving on here, you don't have to worry about any of that. What you're going to find is you're going to get a different matrix equation in blue here, and this thing is just going to be the transpose of that. Why? Because if I wanted to write this the same way I wrote the other one, where the Q was on the left, I would write Q. Transpose dot f bar. And so what this results in is a bunch of equations that look like this. F, X, R. You can literally take this into Mathematica. 
write out q is equal to the rotation matrix. Uh, write your vector as just like a list f x f f y and do q dot f and it'll spit these things out. So if you're kind of confused as to where these blue equations are come from, just load up Mathematica and you can and you can really quickly dig back into your into your algebra. I read out this first one to point out that not only are the bars and the not bars on the opposite sides of the equation, but you'll notice that we got we a sign change here. That sign change has to do with the fact that we're going to take the transpose of my little green thing here, T. So let's do this out. We're going to have F I. Cosine, negative sine, sine, cosine, cosine, negative sine, cosine, and then a whole bunch of zeros. And now on the right hand side, we have the bar terms. And hopefully you see that this thing is just the elemental symptoms matrix transpose. Pausing, questions, transformations, other things. Why are we doing this? No questions? All right, if there's no questions, which I don't believe that there are, but I will forward ahead anyway, I will remind you that what we're trying to do is take this equation, which we know everything now, because we know this, and we know what these forces and displacements are, and we're trying to actually get this equation, and we're going to do that by taking So what are we going to do? We're going to say, okay, I have the, the elemental stiffness equation. And my goal is to figure out what on earth the elemental stiffness matrix is in global coordinates. So how do I do that? Well, I have I now have my a way to write my local forces in terms of global coordinates. And I now have a way to write my local displacements in terms of global coordinates. And so I can insert those in there. So this equation 
I want to write this in a kind of more compact form, so I don't have to write it out as a big, big matrix, I would write V bar is equal to the transformation of my element times U. And over here, I would say F is equal to the transformation matrix of my element transpose times F bar. Um, those probably should have these, shouldn't they? They should. All right, let me put these where they belong. Elemental displacement vector, elemental displacement vector. And similarly here. Now it makes it probably easier to see. So now I can take this and put it here. So instead, this becomes. A E T E Not that bad, right? Unfortunately, I don't have a nice clean expression for F bar E. However, if we're willing to just say, well, I could just multiply both sides of my equation. Technically, I'm going to be left multiplying it because it's on the left of my F bar. I could just left multiply my equation by that TE transpose. And then I'll have the left side of my equation in terms of my global force vector, right? I want. F equals KE with no bars. So I need to get this force. So I can just take this thing. I have F bar E. So if I multiply F bar E by TE transpose, and then I equivalently left multiply this by TE transpose, I'm going to have my force vector. So I would say that I have. TE transpose F bar E equals TE transpose K bar E E. And this is clearly this. But, and now look what I have. I have I have F, I have an equation that says F of E equals something times U of E. The F is in global coordinates, the U is in global coordinates. That something must be my master stiffness matrix in global coordinates. Has to be. So this thing has to be equal to A E. So my mass stiffness uh, matrix it, or an element in global coordinates looks like this. And I will point out that this really looks just like all the stress transformations that we already did. Our transformation matrices are a little bit more complicated. Normally, we just have Q. Q is just cosine, sine, negative sine, cosine. Now we have a little bit more complicated stuff because we have kind of four things that are rotating, but it's really just kind of two Qs. But look, the end result is my rotation thing transpose dotted into my actual thing dotted into my rotation thing. I'll just point out that this looks this looks a lot like this equation. So my stress tensor in uh, 
mean coordinates is equal to q. Oh yeah, we had it backwards. Oh, okay, cool. All right, that's even better then. It's flipped because we're this is like the new coordinates and this is the old one. We're kind of we want the opposite here. But this is like the same stuff. It's all linear algebra. It's just rotating objects. So this is the same form of the same equation. Nonetheless, this is our answer. This is this gives us exactly what we want. This is the answer to what is this surface matrix. It's a pain to do by hand, so we won't do that. It's very trivial to do in Mathematica, it's one line of code. But now, instead of our master stiffness matrix being this thing, which is in local coordinates, we can finally write our master stiffness matrix in global coordinates, which is equal to A or B times cosine squared sine cosine negative cosine squared negative sine cosine cosine squared negative sine cosine squared negative cosine squared Now it probably becomes a little bit more clear why I made that annoying abbreviation of sine and cosine. Whenever you get to something like this, where you derive some kind of board looking equation, the first thing you should do is see if there's a way you can check yourself to see if it if it seems like it might be right. So when you're done, when you're done copying this down, ask yourself, what does this matrix reduce to if I take the angle to be zero? Oh, it looks like the one. Exactly. We recover this matrix. We recover this thing, which is that makes sense because we derived this thing with a coordinate system that had the x be perfectly aligned with x bar. So the angle was zero. And if you can't see that immediately, just remember that anything that has an s is a sign. Anything sine theta, but sine of zero is going to be zero. So everything in here is going to be zero except these four components that are just cosines. It's one, so the squares don't matter. You get one, negative one, negative one, one. We recover the stiffness matrix that we would expect to find when it's when the number is aligned with the local coordinate system, the global coordinate system. So that's good. That's exciting. This is this works. So the first step, if you're if you're if we're going to move mentally from pen and paper on the blackboard to I want to write a MATLAB script that's going to do this, the first thing you're going to do is code up a function that you take as inputs the 
E, A, and L. And then you could take as inputs the angles so that you have theta, but chances are you don't really know the angle. Think about you're taking a mesh. You're, you're taking some complicated structure and you're splitting it into a mesh of nodes and elements. You don't know the angle between all those elements and, the, and the, uh, whatever coordinates in your structure is. However, what you do know whenever you mesh something is the location of those mesh points. So if you have an element that looks like, here's some crazy structure. That you will know these locations. Why is that useful? Because each one of these is my is a particular element. So I can highlight one, this one here, and say, okay, well, if I know the location of the red dot, or if I know the location of this dot and this dot, I can find the angle relative between those things and the horizon. So typically what your function is going to look like is you're going to you're going to feed your function E, A, and L for, for a given element. Probably won't even feed it out. You might as well just say, hey, let it calculate L. If I know the nodal positions, I can use Pythagorean theorem to, to, to tell me, or the Euclidean distance to tell me what the distance of my, of my object is. So I'm going to feed my function EA and the node positions, and it's going to calculate L and the angle, and it's going to spit out this thing. And so then what you're going to do is you have a thousand elements, and you're just going to run a for loop that's going to say, okay, here's the EA. And the node positions spit out that uh, elemental synthesis matrix for each of my elements. You could do this right now. We're going to do this not right now, but we're going to do it pretty soon. We're probably going to do it once we wrap up the entire procedure. But this would be the first function you would write if you're going to script up the direct synthesis matrix in, in a method in MATLAB or Python. And you're going to want to be able to say, given the nodal positions of my elements, Given its material properties and geometry, what is the elemental stiffness matrix for it? And once we have that, then we're in the position of saying, I have, I calculated this. Where do I put these values? Like I drew up here. Where do I put these values in the master stiffness matrix of my entire structure? Okay, questions. I don't know if it's helpful to see this, but like, for instance, we could go back to our particular truss. Our truss is this thing. And I could give you stuff. I could give you. For instance, I could say, for example, for our particular truss, I could say EA of the first L of the first member, which is this bottom one, is equal to oh, the bottom one's kind of boring. Equal to 100. Its length is equal to 10, and its angle. To zero, and you can quickly say, well, 100 over 10 is 10, and then I'm just going to have one zero one. So I'm going to be able to say that my elemental system for this thing is 10 times one zero negative one. So I've calculated the stiffness matrix for the first member of my of my truss. I can do that for the second one. I can give you EA and L, get it for the second one, get it for the third one. And now all we have to do, remember there were three steps in this process. One was we idealized the structure. We said, okay, it's a member, it's got nodes, it's got a global coordinate system. Then we broke the structure down and blew apart all these things. We said, 
let's turn, he said, let's let us turn this thing into this thing, where each member is all by itself, all alone. And it has two nodes. And we can do a force balance to figure out the relationship between force and displacement of this structure, which is what we did down here. We said, let's pretend it's a linear spring. Then we derived the elemental stiffness equation, which looks like this. So clearly, this picture, while it was really useful for us to derive the elemental stiffness picture, we know that it's, it's a bit of a lie. And the reason why it's a bit of a lie is because this node can't do anything differently than this node because they're the same node. We have to now go back and reassemble our structure and give it some constraints, which is that, well, anything that this thing does, this one has to do too, because they're really the same thing. So that's the next step. So our three steps were idealize, uh, breakdown, and then assembly. And that's where we're at right now. This would be a good place to, to pause though. So why don't we take like a, oh, A, something that's calculated. Hold on a second, let me read this question to the class. Is A something that is calculated or defined by the structure? A is the cross-sectional area of the member. These are all trusses for what we're doing right now. So, so we're doing simple planar trusses where E is the elastic modulus of the bar. A is the cross-sectional area. Generally, you know L, but if you don't know L because this is your kind of um, meshing a structure into a truss, like you're just kind of saying, okay, I'm going to put nodes here, there, there, then you can calculate L based on the node locations. So A is generally known, not calculated. Uh, it's usually, it'll usually be given. Um, L can be determined, E is known, and your angles can be determined by the location of the node points. So your question. All right, let's come back at like 9.58 and we'll go to the next step. Now that we found KE, we can start to assemble this thing. Go big master to these pictures. Take like an eight minute break.
All right. Our goal now is pretty straightforward. We have to reassemble our structure. And there's two rules that we'll use to reassemble it. They'll both be very obvious when I say them. Um, that will allow us to calculate what each member's contribution to the master stiffness matrix is. What I mean by that is we're going to figure out what each member adds to this big, huge matrix here. And as you'll see, we're going to basically just literally add them up. And once we've added up all of the, each member's contribution to the whole structure, then we have a structural stiffness equation, F equals KU, where F are your applied forces and some unknown reactions. U are your boundary conditions and some unknown displacements. And your K is all of each individual member's contribution to the stiffness of that structure. Makes sense. It's the it's the way that each member adds to how stiff this structure is in responding to force of displacement. We will be able to finish this today. And then next class is going to be a hands-on, like we're going to, I'm going to have breakout rooms and we're going to be trying to code this up. Generally, we're not able to kind of finish that whole thing in one class. So it'll probably be all of next week will be like us just playing in MATLAB, trying to get a functional, um, you know, really rudimentary basic finite element solver up and running. Um, and so um, we'll, uh, we'll be starting that probably Thursday and then carry it over to, to Tuesday. And then we'll, then we'll come back and see how we can make it more complicated. But the, the general structure will be, will be there. So here's where we're at. We, we've got to reassemble things. Step three, going back all the way to that slide the other day, which we're going to reassemble things. I never loaded this structure, so let's load this structure. So I'm going to take the same trust that we drew to motivate everything. And I'm going to a, apply a, a force. Ah. Here. I'll call it F3 because it's the force acting on joint three. And you could uh, decompose this into an F X3, which would be Q2. Well, actually, I have to give you what the magnitudes are. And then F Y3. And I'm going to say that. My force vector, well, I'll just give you the components of each of these. Fx3 is equal to 2. And Fy3 is equal to 1. So this is how our structure is loaded. It's a truss being pulled on diagonally upwards on that top joint there. And what we want to do is we want to get to the point where we could solve for the displacements of each node, and then how much force, tension, or compression is each member of this truss carrying. So there's two rules when we want to reassemble this. And they're both pretty obvious. One that has a fancy name, and it goes back to something we talked about but didn't really get into the details of it, and that is we have to require that there is a compatibility of displacements. This is trivial. Two members, if they meet at the same joint, that the individual, uh, their 
the displacements of each member's uh, node has to be the same. So I have this where I kind of delineated. I split up my truss like this. And all I'm saying is the displacement of this thing has to equal the displacement of this thing. The displacement of this one has to equal the displacement of that one. And the displacement of this one has to equal the displacement of that one. Because they're really the same. We split them up for convenience so that we can actually figure out what each member is contributing to the local stiffness matrix. But now that we're putting it back together, we have to say that those things aren't individual or separate nodes. So as such, if we look at, for instance, the displacement of node three here, it can have a displacement in the X direction or a displacement in the Y direction. Our notation looks a little bit weird because our notation says, well, hey, I have a, a displacement U in the X direction for node three. And I can determine this for element two, which would be the vertical element. And this has to be equal to the displacement in the X direction for node three of that node for the other element. So this is literally the mathematical way of saying that green stuff there, that the X direction displacement of this node has to equal the X direction displacement of this node. Similarly, the y displacement. Uh, that's terrible. Let's go back here. Similarly, the y displacement of this node has to equal the y displacement of that node. And that's how we enforce the compatibility of displacements. We do this for for all of them. What it ends up doing is just kind of really simplifying the displacement vector in which we don't have to worry too much about these elemental differences anymore. We essentially just say, well, those are not different. So therefore, I just need to keep track of ux3. I just need to keep track of uy3. It was useful for us to get a force and displacement balance. But now I don't need it anymore. I can just remove the elemental notation, which takes us from having one, two, three, four, five, six to times two, which is 12 degrees of freedom. So now we have six degrees of freedom. Great. We just cut our degrees of freedom in half. So that's the first rule. You have to do that for all of them. And that's really what that's going to do is going to really shrink the displacement vector down to just six unknowns, which makes sense. There's x and y. For each of the three nodes. We don't know what they are. The second one is also pretty standard for mechanical engineers, and that is we have to ensure that everything is in force equilibrium, just like we always do. You might be asking, how come we're not ensuring that there's a moment balance or a moment equilibrium here? That's because our truss is too simple. It actually can't withstand any moments right now. It's just pins. So you could apply it a moment at node three and the structure doesn't have the ability to, to withstand a, restrict, uh, a resistance to, to bending. That can be done by adding in more physics, going back to our elemental synthesis matrix and kind of making it more complicated, which we'll do. Okay, this isn't too bad either. So just a reminder from statics of what's going on here. So let's look at, again, this up here. I'm going to just draw a little free body diagram. I'm doing a free body diagram from the perspective of how these forces are acting on the joint. And I will clearly have some force vector here, F3, and that's going to be balanced by 
a force vector here, which we will call negative F3. And this is the contribution from member two. And at some other angle, I will have another negative F3 coming from element three. The actual elements here are, are in tension, right? Like element two and element three are in tension. I'm looking at the force, the free body diagram at the joint. So what are the, kind of what's happening at that joint? We have one force pulling up and these forces are pulling down. But in reality, if I was to draw, you know, the free body diagram from the perspective of, of the of the members, I would have a different story in which those would be getting kind of pulled toward the, the node. Okay, just a force balance. This is very straightforward. So this first part is elemental you've done it so many times you probably can do it in your sleep but then we're going to complicate it just a little and so what does this first part say this first part says obviously that uh, my force some of the forces equal zero so if f3 is positive and f3 2 and f3 3 are negative they're all equal to zero these are the, the force vectors right now. Those are vectors. So we can split those up into their components and look at the X component and Y components of these force balances and write them down as F X3 is equal to F X3 of member two plus F X3 three. And similarly, this is what you would do in statics. This is what you would do solving this paper, uh, solving this problem on, on pen and paper. Uh, but it's actually going to be really beneficial for us. So these are the two. So before I move on, these are the two things that we have to enforce. We have to enforce the compatibility of displacements. We have to enforce uh, an equal a force balance, an equilibrium of the forces at the, each joint. Computers are absolutely incredible at matrix calculations. And there's a particular power, and this is, this is really kind of why MATLAB kind of uh, became such a powerful tool for engineers, is because not only are, are computers really good at matrix calculations, there's also a way to reduce the memory storage by using sparse matrices, which if you're not familiar with the sparse matrix, it's basically, you don't populate it with zeros, which are going to store bits in the computer. You have essentially only numbers where there are numbers and then just kind of placeholders everywhere else. It sounds like a really trivial distinction between having a bunch of zeros and having a bunch of uh, nothings, but you're storing less information in memory. And so not only do you have a computer that's really good at doing matrix calculations, it's now has less to store, so we can do the calculations even faster. Why am I talking about sparse matrices and zeros and all of this? And the reason is because you would never think to do what we're about to do if you're doing this on pen and paper. But for the sake of writing a really efficient computer algorithm, what we're about to do helps kind of streamline this process in a in a in a, in a kind of a surprising way. Look at our force equations here. I have that the force 
at x3 is equal to the sum of the forces for um, member two and member three. We're always allowed to add zeros to our equations. So it turns out that we can write this in a really uh, efficient way for writing a computer algorithm if we add zeros to these two vectors here. Now, what zeros are we going to add? Well, I've kind of given it away. We've got two and three there. Why don't instead we write this like this, fx3 is equal to fx3 from member one plus fx3 from member two plus fx3 from member three. And same thing. So obviously I'm adding zero because the, the member one isn't even touching the, the, those other two members. It's definitely contributing zero force there. And so these quantities are zero. They're not even connected to joint three. Uh -huh. But now we have a really compact way of writing this in which that we can just simply say that rule two, our force equilibrium, is simply F equals F1 plus F2 plus F3. Or it's just the sum from I1 to the number of members of F. I. This provides one equation that is really nicely compact and easy to implement that is valid for the entire structure. Your alternative is you have to go through and figure out what these force balance equations are for each at each joint, each node. Because this one only two and three contribute. You might have ones in which one and three, one and two. But remember that we're talking about something that we might be discretizing a structure into thousands or millions of mesh points. So we would really like a convenient, fast, compact way of, of, of writing this force equilibrium out. So we just added zeros, kind of in a really compact notation here, but we need to go back and we need to actually augment We need to, did I have to write that out? Yeah, we need to do is, here we go, perfect. We need to take something like this, but in global coordinates, and we need to add to it rows and columns of zeros that correspond to the vectors we just added, right? We added the vector F1, which was zeros to our uh, force vector three. We need to add it to our equation here. We need to add a bunch of zeros to it. And how do we do that? It's called augmenting the stiffness matrix. And I'll show you that now. This is the, this is a point of confusion because what I'm about to show you is meant to kind of 
help you conceptually understand how we add zeros to our force and stiffness matrices. It's not necessarily the fastest way to do this on a computer, the actual explicitly augmenting of the matrices. So when you get when we get to the point where we're pulling this up, we might do it a different way. But in terms of learning what on earth we're doing, this way is a really nice way of showing you how we get to the final equation that we want to solve. So bear with me. It shouldn't be too bad, but this is probably not the way you would implement it in code. And we'll talk through that when we get to that, that step. This is really like a, how do we understand what we're trying to do? So let's look at member one. So normally what we would write is, did I give properties here? Like I did. Oh yeah. All right, let me go back up here. Now I'm gonna give the properties here. Okay. So let me actually spell out this stuff now. So we'll, we'll say for our structure, E A, remember one equals a hundred. L is ten, and theta is zero. Remember two. We'll say it's fifty. The length is also ten. Angle is 90. And remember three. We'll say that EA is 200 root two. Why did I throw a square root in there? It makes the math easier. Ten root two. Forty-five degrees. All right, this will be helpful for us. Okay. So, what are we talking about here? Well, let's look at member one. And if we look at number one, we have that fx1 fy1 fx2 fy2. The ones and twos correspond to joint one, joint two. And this is all referring to element one. So we can put a parentheses one up here. And we already did this, but this is gonna be EA over L for one is gonna be EA over L. So that's gonna be 10. And we know that this thing is not rotated at all. So it's just gonna go back to using this stiffness matrix. So it's going to be 10 times 1, 10 times 0, 10 times negative 1. And so our stiffness matrix looks like this 10, 0, negative 10, 0. Before I move on, make sure that that is okay with you. And that's not that tricky. So remember, what we're doing now is we want to add to it. This one touches joints 
one and two, but doesn't touch joint three. What we want to do is we want to, because we're trying to add zeros to our matrix over here, we want to augment this matrix. Oops, I forgot to write the displacement. We want to augment this matrix by adding joints three to it. Hopefully this is okay. And so clearly we need to, I'm asking you to add joints three. So that's gonna be adding to the bottom of my force vector here, Fx3 and Fy3. And it's gonna be adding the displacements, Ux3 and Uy3. So my new force is gonna look like Fx1, Fy1, Fx2, Y2, Fx3, Fy3. And similarly, Ux1, Uy1, Ux2, Uy2, Ux3, Y3. Now, the top of this thing is the same. I don't have enough room, so let's make it a little bit more room. The top of that one, top left hand corner, is the same, right? because these are the same. And all we have to do is add zeros, two columns and two rows to the end of this member stiffness matrix. Again, this is not how I would approach this computationally. The reason why I'm showing it to you this way is because once we have this, this is now K for element one. There's, there's two points I want to show you here. One, you'll notice that over here, okay, don't write it. You'll notice that over here, the force, the force vector is referring to member one. But you'll notice that the displacement vector is not, that we lost the distinction of that member there. Why did we lose that? We lost it because of the compatibility of displacements. Remember I said we reduced the number of degrees of freedom from 12 to six by saying, hey, these two nodes are the same, so we don't need to distinguish between them. So there's no distinction here of your, what element we're talking about. But look, we have this really compact notation for my force vector. So let's go back to our equations that we know. We know that we're trying to solve this equation. We now know that we can use this in, in for f. So we could say that f equals f1 plus f2 plus f3, which is equal to ku. Since u is Independent, it doesn't matter. We lost the, the element. We don't have to use that parentheses one, two, and three anymore. What this equation means is that all we have to do 
is determine K for each member in this augmented form. And then add them up. So what we would like to solve is this equation right here. Again, we know most, we know some of the forces, we know some of the displacements, we don't know K. The way we're going to find K is by finding K for each individual member and then just adding them up. Adding, this is what, a six by six matrix. We're going to add one six by six matrix, add it to another, add it to another, however many we have, we just add them all up. And then we have the total huge K. And then it's just a matrix algebra. F equals KU, solve for the knowns and unknowns. Okay. We're unlikely to finish this problem today, but we're going to get closer. We'll probably finish it on Thursday. What I'd like you to do right now is to test that you understand what on earth I'm talking about. Augment the member stiffness matrix for members two and three. And I will tell you, you have to think carefully about what joints are missing and where you add the forces for those joints. Here we added at the bottom. That's not always the case. Here we added the unknown displacements at the bottom. That's not always the case. The location of these tell you where you add your rows and columns and zeros. Sorry, let me try that again. Here we added the, un, the, the, the joints that don't touch the member to the bottom and their displacements to the bottom because it's one, two, three. One, two, three. And the location of these, it leads to us adding two rows and two columns of zeros at the bottom. Take a minute and see if you can determine the augmented stiffness matrix K2 and K3 using the same procedure here.
right, let me show you what I have for the second one. Let's see if it's the same. And the third one, I'll add that out as well. I'm writing the light blue colors as the original stiffness uh, matrix, and I'm augmenting it in the darker blue. How'd you do? This make sense? Yeah. The nice thing is, is that at this point, again, I just remind you, our, our goal is to have F equals KU in global coordinates for the entire structure so that we can solve. All we have to do at this point is just add up all the k's. And they're all six by six matrices. And so we just have to add them up. And so that our, our global k is equal to k1 plus k2 plus k3. And let's write that out. It's going to be 20. 10, negative 10, 0, negative 10, 10. Scroll up a hair so you can see. Hopefully, that should be pretty clear. I'm just literally adding component by component of the matrices. And now we're there almost. And why do I say almost? 
So what we want to do is we want to Again, I'll say this one last time. We are trying to solve the following equation. We want to solve my equation for my forces in fx1, fx2, oops, no, just kidding, fy1, fx2, fy2, fx3, fy3. You'll notice that by adding all these stiffness matrices up together, we now are talking about this structure as a structure in its entirety. And the only thing we're actually solving are for the forces and displacements of the nodes. UX1, UXY1, UX2, y2, x3, y3. This is the equation we want to solve. If you try to solve this equation, it won't work. It'll be singular. It'll blow up. Anyone have a guess as to why? Yeah, we have not, we've told it nothing about what's fixing it in place. So this truss in the, in the way of this equation, it's free to translate, it's free to rotate, it doesn't care. But we know some things, we know some boundary conditions. And those boundary conditions are, go back to our truss, the displacements in X or Y of node one are zero, and the displacement in Y at node two is zero. So this is zero. This is zero and this is zero. What do you do when those quantities are zeros? Well, we're going to completely eliminate all the equations associated with them. So we're going to take this thing and we're going to say, well, we can eliminate this top row, this row. And this row. And not only are we going to eliminate those rows, we're going to eliminate the associated columns with that. So this will be eliminating column one, column two, and column four. And what we're left with is a simpler equation, which is that fx2, fx3. Fy3, which are the only non zero things remaining, is going to equal ten zero 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 ten ten zero ten fifty times ux2, ux3, and uy3. Let me point a couple things out. These quantities are simply the ones that we didn't get rid of here. These quantities are the free degrees of freedom. So this is what the how the truss can move, which we don't know. But we do know something. We know that there is an applied force of two and one on unit on node three, and there's no applied force at node two. So I can come back down here and I can fill those out with what we know. I can say that this thing is zero. Fx3 is two, that was given. Fy3 is one. And now we can solve for our unknown displacements. You can solve this equation, three equations, three unknowns, or you can have a computer do it for you such that UX2, 
2x3 and mu y3 equal 0, 0 0.4, and negative 0 0.2. I'm going to stop here for the sake of time, but you could go back and say, okay, now that I know these displacements, I can go back and ask, what are my reaction forces in the other members? I could calculate what my stresses are in those members because I know what the forces are on each of those nodes. And so I could say how much tension or compression is each member will go undergoing. I threw a lot in at the end here. We're, I will review some of this on, on Thursday before we start coding it up. Um, we will, uh, I will ask you to bring the computer. If you're coming to class, we'll, we'll work together in here. If you're a remote, I'll set you up in a breakout room. But our next step will be to, to code this up with such that you could feed it any mesh, material properties, uh, and, and geometry of the, of the members and solve any truss that's being, being loaded. Sorry for taking a long time. Happens by major stuff there. A little messy. Um, and I will uh, see you all on Thursday. Thanks, everyone.